And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to be talking about rethinking our exams. Everybody, you know, we're heading into the final stretch, right? And everybody, I <laughs> see head of your eyes, right? And everybody <laughs> has high anxiety around exams. Um, it can really start to manifest itself pretty quickly in online cheating. Like, what are we going to do about cheating? And I just, we, we really want to take a step back, step back today from how to do these online exams and really just ask you to think about why, what's your purpose of these exams? Why are you doing these exams to begin with? And then what's going to be the best way to do this then with compassion for yourself and for your students? Um, so with that little introduction, I will turn it over to Jay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. And so that's really, I think, where we're at today. And just to make a quick plug, um, I will say that we are offering a couple of workshops next week, next Monday and Tuesday, um, to called Complex Tests in Brightspace, where we're really going to spend some more time introducing folks to not just the, the, the basics of, of Brightspace quizzes, but how to kind of deal with some of the more um, complicated aspects and how to, how to get in some of those more challenging questions as well. So um, if some of those questions come up today, we'll often kind of just kind of uh, push you off, um, encourage you to, to attend next week, um, which will be much more kind of hands-on uh, technical uh, kind of workshop. Today is a little more um, philosophical, I think, in nature. So. Um, just to kind of get us started, um, we do encourage folks uh, to uh, share with the world um, that they are learning along with us. Um, if you tweet or use Instagram or Facebook, uh, please make sure you um, um, let everybody know um, what you're learning with us today um, and uh, include our username in that um, and include our uh, hashtag keep teaching Zula which also refers to the website we've been, uh, we've set up and, and have been encouraging faculty to, to get resources for um, in this time of, of remote teaching. So um, to get, get us started, um, <clears throat> our objectives for today, our learning outcomes uh, for today. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about this idea of high stakes testing. Um, and then we're gonna try to uh, talk about why we might want to uh, rethink a little bit the idea of our use of high stakes testing, um, and then think about some ways we might actually implement um, that, those changes and that, that rethought. So that's really our uh, goal for uh, today. To get us started, we're gonna ask you to do um, a quick little survey, and I think Elizabeth is gonna share the link with you. Just really doesn't want to cooperate today. Okay, <clears throat> so this you may have seen this if you're on if you're on um, Twitter um, or if you're on um, any other kind of social media. This has been making its rounds a little bit. It was developed by um, uh, Julia Forsyth, who's the associate director for the Center for the Pad Pedagogical Innovation at Brock University, and this little um, cartoonish. Uh, flowchart, uh, decision tree, I think kind of sums up really the thinking behind what we wanted to just talk a little bit about in today's workshop, which is this question of do you, do you need to put um, uh, that exam online, which I think is a big question that came up early on when we realized we were going to have to switch to remote teaching. Right? I think a lot of us kind of jumped forward and started thinking, if not about the final exam, about whatever exam we had lined up. Um, but now, as Elizabeth said, as we move towards um, the Easter break um, and we think about the fact that when we get back from the Easter break, we'll have, uh, what, three, three full weeks of class left um, before final exams, right? And so um, if we haven't started thinking about what our final exam is going to look like in this world of emergency remote teaching, um, it's something we do need to start thinking about um, now. And so you can see some of the ideas behind um, this flowchart. Um, again, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but at the same time, I think it offers some really good um, suggestions for this, which is, do you need to put that exam online? And if so, do you want to consider uh, changing the weight distribution for that exam? Does it need to be as heavy as it is in a normal class under normal circumstances? 
Um, if you do need to put it online, um, can what are you going to need to do to digitize it? Right. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that today, but we'll also get into that a lot more um, in the sessions that we're offering next week as well. Those are the complex uh, exams on Brightspace. Um, but the real other question here is, could you redesign um, that exam? Could you challenge the students to do something that would still assess those learning outcomes, right? Because this is ultimately what we're getting back to with, with exams. Um, could you give them something that would allow them to demonstrate what they've learned in a way that might be a little less stressful, that might be a little less technologically challenging um, for both them and you in terms of setting it up? as well and so that's really just kind of the, the thinking that's this is kind of the impetus for, for today's uh workshop here all right so real quickly one of the reasons we'd suggest you we just might want to spend a little time rethinking this is some of the scholarship that is out there and in recent years um before anybody was thinking about emergency remote teaching um and COVID-19 um there was a lot of research going on about the value of exams, um, what we get out of exams, and more importantly, what students get out of exams, right? Um, and this idea, um, really, um, according to Volk um, from just a couple of years ago, um, that an exam, a test, is a neutral event um, in that it measures something, but it has no real impact on learning in and of itself, right? Um, and if we think about how much time we devote to exams giving exams uh, in class or giving exams even online that students are taking outside of class um, in that they're demonstrating something, but at the same time, they're not actually learning anything during that time. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's an interesting question to kind of ask ourselves, right? Um, what's, what's the value here if they're not actually learning anything with this time? Um, <clears throat> but then also along uh, what Volk really kind of emphasizes is that assessment practices themselves can produce larger gains in long-term retention of information and concepts in comparison. So there are these alternatives that can ultimately have greater impact on student learning. The students are doing work that demonstrates what they've learned, right? So it's, it's, it's having that assessment impact for us, right? Um, but at the same time, they're actually learning more and learning better uh, through the process, um, which is not something that happens when they take a typical exam. Right? Um, and then more specifically, um, Radiger and I'll talk um, uh, about this idea of retrieval practices, right? And retrieval practice is the act of calling information to mind rather than just rereading re it or hearing it, right? So it's not simple studying, right? But it's studying, it's, it's doing something with that information um, at the time that you're learning it, right? Um, and ultimately, both these ideas lead to greater long-term retention um, and the ability to transfer information. And, and all of us have talked, and I think uh, often kind of talked negatively about how students are learning something in one class and then they get to our class a year or two years later and they seem to have completely forgotten what they learned um, in those foundational classes, right? So there's no transfer taking place, right? Um, so these ideas of uh, retrieval practices, of assessment, of, of alternative assessments, um, offer some, some different ideas that address some, some problems that we've been talking about, like I said, before we, we, we found ourselves in this world of remote teaching as well. Yeah, and I want to mention, I want to say one other thing about, about retrieval practice. Um, I, I think giving yourself time, and, and I know a couple of you, I've talked to you about tests uh, and what you're going to do moving forward and kind of said, come to this workshop so we can kind of talk about uh, some of this, this research. Uh, oftentimes, what we can do ourselves with our tests is we can encourage, memorize, and dump behaviors in students, even in our face-to-face -face classes. Um, if we make a uh, tests that just require memorization and we're never going to test them on this again, they're never going to use it again later in the course, later in the curriculum, um, then they, um, it really does encourage students to learn how to memorize it, dump it on the test, and then just let it go. Um, and there's just study after study that kind of sh shows that. So I want us to think about what's the real long-term learning you're wanting your students to do with the test this the, with your finals with whatever you're doing moving forward and then how to best achieve that in a way that is compassionate 
to both you and your and your students. So I want to say something about uh, compassion here. I really like this uh, quote in this emergency teaching time. We need to exercise compassion toward our students and ourselves and make the very best of what we have and can do. Kindness is now more than anything an important watch word. And I think this is especially true at Xavier with our mission and our students. Um, we have, so let me also say right here, let me reiterate what I've said in numerous different occasions, is what we are doing right now is not effective, excellent online teaching, right? That's a whole pedagogy that has a lot of prep going into it. You choose it as a teacher and then students choose it as a learner, right? What we are doing now is emergency remote triage teaching. And um, because of this, there's, there were all these things that, that, sh that sh are usually are in place in online teaching that aren't in place now. Um, we don't know the internet access of our students. We don't know their computers, they, we know what kind of systems they have, what their systems can handle. And when we think about going straight to respond as lockdown browser and our lockdown browser and response monitor and those kind of things to you know, lock the students down during testing, there are, there are all kinds of system requirements that, that students need for that. They have to have a camera on their computer, for instance. They have to have these kind of things. Now, if you're designing an excellent online course moving forward into the future, you can put that in the syllabus. If you take this course, you're going to have to have these kind of systems, uh, you know, th this kind of technology at hand, you're going to have this kind of internet at hand, and then you um, are going to be tested in this kind of way. And then students know that going into it, just like they do with anything in our syllabus, and they can choose it, and, and it just it makes it for better, you know, and then they know this moving forward, and you can demand it of them. We really have no idea what kind of situations all of our students are going into. I know you've talked to a lot of yours because I know that you all are very connected teachers. I know that you've found out more about their home life maybe than you ever thought you would ever know. <laughs> like right now, I'm seeing your homes <laughs> in the background. So, um, but you still, you don't know. Like again, how much support do they have? What kind of situation do they go into? I've got a student who is in my class um, who during my class, she's having to watch her nieces now because her, her sister is still having to work. So, you know, I, we don't know the situation these students are in. And so then if you put them in this kind of lockdown situation, um, you know, is this, is this fair? Is this compassionate to them? They're already stressed about all this um, readjustment, just like we are, just like we are. Um, and they're already stressed about getting a good grade in your class. Then you add another level it can be problematic. Now I'm looking at my dear STEM colleagues as I'm saying this, and I know that sometimes this is unavoidable, right? I know that you coordinated classes and this is the route you have to go. I just wanna challenge you to think about it. Is this the route you need to go? So that if it is, you can really explain it to your students with compassion, with care, and then so that they'll understand. Elizabeth, um, you have a few comments, a question and comments going in chat, and I think they're really important. Ray Lang asks, can we stipulate hardware requirements in the syllabus? And we have a few responses. Um, Dr. Huda says, not now, because it was not a requirement when they enrolled in the class. Tyra Gross goes on to say, in a context of a prepared online hybrid class, yes. And then Ray Lang responds, right, I get that, before a course that's intended to be online. I think right. those are good points. Excellent job, colleagues. That's exactly right. If you, uh, just like, um, just like in your syllabus, you can stipulate they have to buy this book, right? Some of our books are really expensive. You stipulate they have to buy this. You can't stipulate it midway through the semester. Now, guess what? You have to buy this book. Um, so yeah, exactly. And that's why I always emphasize the difference between um, emergency remote triage teaching and excellent online teaching. Um, Okay, and then that's why I wanted, I'm so grateful you're all taking this time to think about what are the tests that you are gonna give and why, and is it the best way to do it for students? So with that, I will turn it back over to Jay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think in terms of thinking about compassion, uh, we also want you to think uh, about uh, being compassionate to yourselves, right? And we wanna think about this idea of emergency teaching and and what we're able to do in a reasonable amount of time right and so if, if you've got a you know a five page six page 
final exam that you traditionally give um, on paper, right? Um, getting that transferred over to Brightspace, you know, we, we, can, we can help you with some of that, but, but getting that transferred over to Brightspace is gonna be um, a lot of work uh, on your part, right? Um, if it's, uh, so maybe, again, there are some alternatives, right? Um, and so, again, we wanted to just talk today and get you all to think a little bit today about some of the alternatives that um, might be more compassionate, um, for both you and for your students um, as well. So just in terms of kind of a final um, um, idea to think about is this idea of uh, a term called authentic, authentic uh, assessment, right? Um, which is to, goes back to kind of think really the original idea, which is, is this um, a task that really challenges the students uh, at all the levels that the student needs to be challenged, right? Um, and you can see this kind of rough breakdown, which is that a typical test requires the student to give correct responses, right? Whereas an authentic task right, requires them to give a high quality product um, and a justification for the solutions. So they're still held responsible for giving, um, showing what they know, right? Um, but they're showing what they know and they're doing it in a high quality way. And they're also explaining um, how they got that answer in the first place, right? So correctness is not the only criterion that's involved. Right? Uh, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but you can kind of see the idea here, which is that um, authenticity challenges us to think about ways of assessing our students in ways that are much more um, both engaging, I think, um, effective, um, but also more expansive. Right. Um, well, at the same time, I think in some in some ways simplifying the process, right? Because um, a hundred hundred question test um, is is a pretty complex thing, um, but an essay that challenges them to think about the same things and demonstrate the same knowledge and learning um, is in some ways a much simpler thing, right? As well. So I think there's pros and cons to this, as Elizabeth said. Every class is different, every teacher is different, every situation is different, but we just want you to think about some of the alternatives um, that might be available to you for all these different reasons. So <clears throat> one way we wanted to suggest that you might rethink um, some of these exams is to think about the fact um, that maybe an open book exam um, is still an alternative for you and your students, right? Um, we've, we've had a lot of questions as soon as this, as soon as all this remote teaching started going, um, we started getting a lot of, a lot of questions about, you know, how do you lock down the browser, respond as lockdown browser, um, which if you're not familiar with, um, kind of limits what the students can do while they're taking a test. So they can't go off to other websites, um, they can't look up words, um, they can't do anything really except take the test um, uh, during the test, right? Um, and then there's a second component called Respondus Monitor, um, which basically turns on their webcam and kind of takes um, kind of still shots uh, of them over the course of the exam so that you can then kind of, the teacher can go back and kind of take a look and make sure the student wasn't flipping through their book or something like that. Um, and again, under certain circumstances, um, that's really the best and, and necessary way to, to give an exam. Um, but our question really to you is kind of, is that always uh, the case? Right? And so one option is to rethink your exams in terms of making them um, open book, right? Um, so some things you'd want to think about if you were doing this, right? So that you're not just flipping through the book and looking for the answer, right? Because that's, that's not an effective test. Um, but an open book test where they've got access to uh, some of the information from class, right? But they don't have the answers, right? So ask more conceptual questions as opposed to right or wrong questions, right? So instead of just asking them what's the solution to this problem, ask them to explain what's the next step in this, uh, in solving this problem. Um, state the definition of something, um, explain why um, a hypothesis is necessary for this situation, right? So instead of just saying, what's the right answer here, but, but have them explain how they got to that right answer. Okay. Um, instead of having them solve a problem, um, and again, you know, Elizabeth and I were really surprised about this, but I think um, before we left campus, we, we met with some folks from math, and I think uh, Bill Jones uh, showed Elizabeth this app where a student could write in the question, um, and then the app would give not only the answer, um, but kind of the full kind of proof um, of the answer, right, um, which is just kind of 
mind numbing. Um, you can think about how much trouble I had coming up with proofs when I was in high school. But um, so instead of just asking students to do that, ask them to identify an error in a proof or computation, right? Because that's not going to be so easy to find. Right? Um, favorite questions where students can scan and upload work. And we've, we've worked with some faculty on ways that you can do this um, with, with the quizzes function in Brightspace. And again, that's something we'll probably spend some time talking about next week as well, um, the possibilities and also the limitations of that. Um, and then some other tips as well. If you're taking problems from a, from a textbook, um, think about changing not just the numbers of the question, um, but the details of the question, right? Um, think about ways that the questions can be kind of randomized so different students have different uh, questions as well, right? Um, again, part of this is kind of suggesting that we realize that, um, off, you know, honesty and accuracy is important, um, but there's different ways to kind of go about this as opposed to just relying on the lockdown browser option, which we've we've honestly had a lot of problems with, right? Students don't have cameras on their computers sometimes. Um, computers, students don't have the high speed internet access they need for it. Um, they have other technical problems as well. Um, it's hard enough to kind of deal with those when students are on campus um, and now they're spread out around the country, right? Um, so we're really running into some walls with those things. So are there ways we can rethink some of these things and work around them in this kind of emergency situation? Jay, can I jump in here for mm -hmm. a second? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to bring in another point as Jay is discussing these alternatives and other ways to think about um, assessing your students' learning. Um, and that's universal design for learning. And if anyone's familiar with that, you know, that's the idea. The whole purpose is um, to give your students multiple ways to demonstrate their learning. So um, if you think in terms of um, one of your colleagues or her French class, I know that the students have written exams where they write um, French words, they have an oral where they are pronouncing and they're discussing. And if you think along the lines of that course, those students have multiple ways to demonstrate their knowledge of the French language to the professor and they're, they're graded on those things accordingly. So the idea here as Jay discusses these different um, opportunities, this is another chance to think about um, other ways you can have your students demonstrate that they have knowledge of the concepts that you're teaching and um, not necessarily just one way because in places where they have put UDL practices into place, they have seen grades go up. Um, and it's not because students are cheating, it's because students now have ways that, oh, I can express it this way. This is how I understand it. And I'm being given the opportunity to present it that way. So um, I just wanted everybody to consider as you think about these things and you may be modifying things or not going forward, um, that that's another benefit because you open up um, the world to many of your students to demonstrate their learning in a way that's best for them. Absolutely. Thank you, Tira. I think that's, that's an important point uh, to bring in here uh, as well. Um, and with that in mind, um, again, if it's possible, again, maybe an exam in and of itself isn't even all that ultimately necessary, at least under these circumstances. Could students demonstrate, again, what, they, what they've been learning over the course of the semester by doing um, some kind of paper? Could they do it through a video presentation? Um, could they do it through an e-portfolio where they're collecting the work they've done all semester and then putting some reflection into it to talk about how their learning has evolved over the course of the semester? Could they create some sort of fact sheet or, or infographic or public service announcement um, that explains the concepts um, that they've been learning about all semester um, to a different audience? Right? Um, or could they do some other kind of project, creative project, group project, right? There's a lot of alternatives out there. Um, and as Tiara was just saying, in addition to the other ideas we've been suggesting to you, um, making it more accessible to a variety of students um, and giving them a little more freedom and creativity in what they do um, can have uh, long lasting repercussions as well. Okay, so what we really wanted to do today was present just some of these ideas to you and then ask you all to spend some time um, playing with them a little bit um, and also demonstrating for you as, as we often do. 
uh, some of the functions that you can use in Zoom if you're not uh, familiar with them. So we're going to do a little bit of a think pair share here. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do is take uh, just a couple minutes um, to think to yourself, first of all, um, and again, go back to that class that you were thinking about at the beginning of, of the workshop here, for example. Um, assuming you've got either a final, an actual final exam or kind of one big test uh, at the end of the semester. What's one way, as we've kind of started talking about it, that you might, just in theory, um, be able to rethink that exam? Could you give it as an open book? Um, and what, what would you need to change um, in order to do that? Could you replace uh, part of it or all of it with, with uh, one or more of those uh, more uh, assignments that we were just talking about, those more authentic assessments as we've been talking about? Um, and then after you've had a minute to think about those on your own, I'm going to send you off into breakout rooms with one or two other people to share your ideas for a few minutes. Um, and then I will pull you all back for kind of a final discussion. There, I think we're all back. So before we kind of go ahead and share, I did want to just um, uh, I think Sarah was asking about infographics before. I just kind of looked um, online real quickly and happened to find this one about exam stress. Um, and so you can see that it, it's, it's a combination of, of kind of iconographic uh, imagery um, to present specific information um, in kind of a visually appealing way. Um, and so there's often a lot of little charts and graphs, um, but also different different icons uh, to kind of make it a little more visually appealing. But again, you can think about, you know, how students could um, take ideas that they were researching um, and present that um, pretty effectively. Okay, so we have um, a little less than I think 10 minutes left here. And so I would like to hear uh, from each of the groups or a couple of mostly it was pairs, but I think we had a couple of uh, at least one uh, group of three talking. Um, what did you all come up with? What were some ideas that you think might could theoretically be a possible um, response uh, for your class? Uh, Tyra, I think you were going to uh, offer something from your group. Hi. Hi. Um, we were just uh, one talk. Well. Where's my friend? I don't want to jack up her name. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't pay attention to what group was. That's Sarah. From chemistry. Where are you? Where are you? I don't even see her <laughs> name anymore. But anyway, uh, Sarah, are you muted? She. Uh, uh, is it uh, Abu Varma? Burma? Oh, Abba. Abba. Yeah. Abba. 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 She, so where is she? Did she um, <laughs> I know her face, but I never put her face with her name. But um, she was saying because of uh, teaching chemistry labs and that they're coordinated, mm. it was kind of like figuring out just how to condense the questions, mm. um, but realizing that those questions then could never be used again because mm. they've been used in the online assessment. So that was one challenge that she was talking about. And <clears throat> I was just kind of mentioning thinking about the compassion piece that you mentioned, like the balance of the compassion for the students and for self. And it's kind of like, well, we're all kind of burnt out. We're zoomed out, all of these things. So it seems really convenient to do multiple choice, true, false, matching format, because then Brightspace will auto grade it. Mm. But at the same time, you know, uh, if you were doing, an, like you said, a hundred item in class uh, exam, and then you try to condense those questions down, it's, it's still, um, you still have to build that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then students could easily, if you're not using lockdown browser, because that backfired uh, with me this semester, mm. I thought I would use it now. And then students were like, I'm using my phone or my laptop mm -hmm. is outdated. Like I can't, uh, so then I had to un unconfigure it, but um, just kind of thinking of narrowing down questions or how can you do these alternative formats if you kept saying, okay, we're going to have an exam, you're going to have a final exam, but then if you switch to an alternative, I know we can be flexible upon these things, but then having to think of how to then score this unique thing mm. um, and then the time that it takes. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that is that is a factor, right? Uh, figuring out uh, how you would go about um, uh, evaluating them is, is is another factor you need to think about um, as well. Thank you. Uh, who else? Another group. Okay. Um, yeah, I was in the group. This is Michael. I was in the group with Ray, and he was talking about customized individual projects that each student would would design. And I teach African American music. I was thinking about the possibility of giving something they don't give, uh, which are uh, more listening, not completely, but more listening examples. Hmm. Um, and of course, in terms of compassion, uh, reducing the material instead of being comprehensive. I'm reducing it from the midterm grade on. Mm. So that cuts out, you know, quite a lot of the material that they're responsible for. In theory, they've been tested on it already mm -hmm. up, up into the midterm. So I'm, I'm, I really have to rethink and think about different ways of, of uh, using more musical examples and how to assess that. Because traditionally, I did give true, false, multiple choice, mm. matching, fill in the blank. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. So, so with the music, you would give them like a, a, a passage from a song and ask them to yeah, analyze the, it? Yeah, kind of? two things I thought about right quick was, for example, I could give A, B, C, and D, uh, which one of these songs is not a 12-ball blues? <laughs> you know, or uh, listen to certain styles and mm -hmm. what, which style of music is this or which instrument is this mm -hmm. if, if mm -hmm. it's not visual. Um, things like that. So mm -hmm. I have a lot to think about in terms of that, but I, mm -hmm. at least I'm on the path of, of rethinking that. Great. Great. All right, who else? There's a couple more, I think. Well, I will say something. Uh, Wendy, <laughs> um, so my, my junior senior level seminar students um, are writing a research paper mm. and when um, when this uh, evacuation happened from campus um, I on the first day back online I asked them if they felt that they could uh, mm. complete their research papers and they all agreed and so that's not changing for my my juniors and seniors they don't have a final exam but for my my entry level uh, history, they're ex core courses, but they're history courses. One is Creole Louisiana and one is uh, Vietnam. Um, I was saying to my, to my uh, partner there that um, I was thinking about having them write um, an essay, uh, write an essay as a final exam, um, somehow addressing how their learning has um, changed or shifted, as you said before, Jay, um, over the semester. Um, but I, I'm struggling with that because uh, they do a lot of writing in that class. And in fact, today they're turning in first drafts of their papers. And then in two weeks, they'll be finished with their second drafts of their papers. And so I feel badly asking them, uh, okay, now I'm going to ask you to write another <laughs> short paper. For the final exam so I but I, I like this idea of you know what did you know about um, the Vietnamese diaspora in August and what have you learned up until now but that wouldn't quite be fair because I have students in the class who are um, diasporic Vietnamese people mm. um, and others who are not 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 to to assume that my Vietnamese diasporic students know their history very thoroughly you know some of us don't know our history very well so i i am struggling with this also i'll say one more quick thing and then be quiet um those students also are doing presentations or they've already done presentations mm. so i feel like giving them a, a presentation to do is may maybe overkill on the presentations mm. uh, so i definitely want to consider options and so i'm eager to hear and learn what other options there are thank you yeah that's a good point i mean if you've already got a class where you're doing a lot of 
a lot of those kind of um, other kind of authentic assessments. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a good thing to not not overwhelm them. <laughs> right. Well. Good point. Sarah? Um, so I was in a, a meeting with Monica Pierre, who's MassCom. And so, Wendy, some of your <laughs> things you brought up, I, I'm very interested. Maybe we can even talk offline. So I'm probably not uh, what, the, what they were relating to with ABBA of changing the amount of questions for mm. the lab test. That's true, but the, the, the class I was really thinking about for this is I'm teaching the chemistry of art. So mm -hmm. these are for the non-science majors, right? And so I give two tests this semester. Really, it's so they pay attention and they do some work and they're, you know, this isn't like they are, they're going to go on and become chemists. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have a test scheduled for the whatever Monday before quiet day. And I'm really mm -hmm. thinking that's, pro, you know, these are not, uh, this is a, there's a 1000 level class. And so the tests are usually, uh, you know, what is paint made up of, you know, mm -hmm. of these things. So I'm very interested in doing something different. And I hadn't really thought of doing an essay because I'm a chemist and I don't have my <laughs> students do essays. But if I had to maybe do an essay about something relating to what they learned and um, chemistry and art, that might be a way to get around this. So I'm can I can I add something? Mm -hmm. um, I sat in on Sarah Clunis's, um, um history of art class last year it was it was brilliant but she she uses a lot of um a lot of imagery and analyzing different aspects of of artistic uh of pieces of art and i wonder if you might have your students um identify a piece of art and then in even in an infographic um identify a piece of art and then have them uh, demonstrate through the infographic the different chemical aspects of this mosaic or this uh, oil painting or um, this print or wh whatever um, or you know beadwork uh, a, a Mardi Gras Indian suit you know what <laughs> what is involved in the in the making of sequins or something like that so I think I think there's a great way that you can turn this into a project, maybe even an infographic. So if you if you want, we can discuss it. But I think you have a great uh, opportunity with your class. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Because also the week before, they're all presenting on. They were doing <laughs> their own. Um, I have them do a test and and design a test and carry out a test and present it to the to the mm. class. So. Um, but I do want to say then, uh, Monica, for her mass comm class, she was thinking of not doing a test, but instead getting her students to do what they're, you know, being tested on, whether it be um, uh, writing some press releases mm. or um, the spoken word and, uh, you know, spoken dialogue and um, given updates. So anyway, uh, thank you for those insights. Great. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to offer a little bit what they were talking about or, or contemplating? And I should say, I think a lot of this is, is, is you know, uh, I, don't, I, I wouldn't kind of suggest that the uh, final exam needs to be tossed aside, it, but it could be maybe part of it could be adapted um, or maybe you know one set of questions could be turned into something else um, and kind of break it up um, in different ways and, and have different things kind of turned in um, or just approach it a little bit differently um, to assess the students in different ways uh, as well and while still retaining some of the the more traditional um, you know kind of knowledge demonstration um, but a straightforward exam I just wanted to make sure, Sindhu, I thought I saw you talking and I didn't know oh, you were muted. No, I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we are compassionate. Actually, this morning, one of my best students in Calcul, she couldn't take the test because of some reason. So I'm giving her a makeup yeah. test at 6.30 at whatever time she wanted. So we are compassionate and, sure. and all those things, definitely. 
and we are thinking about the finals also we are going to give different finals we don't give the same finals as we have been giving so yeah. we are talking because most of our classes are departmental classes so we coordinate so, you know, yeah. not well you you all were the ones who got us thinking about this in the first place <laughs> Huh? <laughs> the math department was the one who got us thinking about these things in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> See, they have all these apps, they'll show the steps, it's very easy. So mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. All right, so how can we test them, find out what they really know, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and avoid, again, and I think that's another piece of this, is, is, is to, we, you know, we're never going to avoid all of the traps of, of the technology allows for possible cheating. But at the same time, are there ways we can adapt uh, some of the stuff we do that makes it less, less likely um, or less uh, possible? Mm. Well, it is a little bit over 5.30, and so we are trying to very, be very kind of mindful of people's time um, in these strange uh, times. So um, I do want to thank you all um, for participating and sharing some thoughts and kind of just opening yourselves up, I think, as Elizabeth said, to begin with, to the possibility of, of thinking about things um, uh, in, these, in these different ways. Um, and just to kind of wrap things up, I will remind you, um, that uh, we are going to be sending you uh, shortly um, a survey, probably in the next day or so, um, that asks you uh, the usual questions, but we are continuing to try to do our assessment as best we can um, uh, at this time. And we would encourage you to continue taking a look at the uh, Keep Teaching Zula website, um, which has a lot of resources and a lot of links. And we've really kind of built out the discipline specific section of that. Um, so to say, if I'm teaching a class in math, here are some sites that kind of offer ideas about how to teach math remotely. Um, if I'm teaching history, here's ideas about how to teach remotely, because we recognize that all the disciplines are, are different as well. And Elizabeth has really just been pointing out that we will be starting to transition in the coming weeks um, uh, to pull back a little bit from focusing on the idea so much of emergency remote teaching and to start thinking about um, other forms of more um, more uh, timely thought out online teaching as well since we know that's going to be um, a piece of our you know, short-term future at least for some of us so thank you all for your time we appreciate it um, if i don't see you beforehand have a uh, enjoy the break Okay. Um, and get a little bit of rest um, and time off, definitely. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.